could see how Russian society drifted from remembering the repressions towards suppressing these memories. During the times of uh, perestroika uh, and in the beginning of the 90s, Russia experienced the growing public interest towards what is usually called the difficult issues of history, tragic and traumatic experiences of the Soviet past. The most important step taken during this period was the rehabilitation of the victims of repressions and uh, also the establishment of a memorial day for the victims of political rep repressions. It is uh, celebrated annually on October 30th. Uh, the most important example of this um, attempt to take the blame or take the responsibility for the repressions is of course the Katyn case or Katyn massacre case, I, I would call it. It should be mentioned at a certain point. It was in uh, 1992 that the president of Russia, Boris Yeltsin, handed the contents of the so-called uh, classified file number one to the president of Poland, uh, Lech Walesa. And in 1993, Yeltsin visited the monument uh, to the victims of Katyn in Warsaw and he nearly kneeled down saying forgive us and he laid a wrath at the monument uh, probably trying to resemble somehow the famous uh, move of Willy Brandt kneeling down in Warsaw probably uh, it's a supposition uh, along with the acknowledgement of the responsibility the first half of 90s was the period of self-victimization the attempts were made to construct a narrative of the nation of Russians as the victim of crimes ex executed by the criminal government. Another, uh, uh, the demolition of the monument to Felix Zerzhinsky, who was the head of Bechikan, then uh, GPU, the two predecessor organizations of uh, NKVD and NKGB. Uh, this demolition may be deemed a metaphor of these attempts. The monument to Zerzhinsky, who was personally and directly responsible for thousands of deaths, was pulled down on the night of August 22nd, 23rd, 1991. And as you can see on the pictures here, common Moscovites took uh, active part in, uh, in this process. Another important event of the period was the introduction of the Independence Day of Russia, June uh, the 12th. Today somebody asks uh, independence from what or from whom? Uh, well, June 12, 1990, uh, the first Congress of People's Deputies of RSFSR, the part of the Soviet Union, voted for the declaration of the state sovereignty of Russia. And in this declaration, the rule of the constitution of Russia and the, the rule of Russian law was uh, proclaimed. The beginning of 90s was the time when the rupture with the Soviet past became a strategy of nation building. It was quite explicit. The narrative of a newly born civic nation of Russians was constructed <coughs> as an attempt to provide the basis for constituting a specific national identity. The Russian society of the period was looking for its founding events and its founding fathers in 1991. By the end of 1990s, however, this uh, time horizon of the Russian society started to change. It lengthened, if I may say so, and the Soviet past became a significant part of this uh, horizon. To explain this, uh, the events that followed, we may use the concept of return as one of the forms of oblivion. For the Russian society, the period of perestroika and the beginning of 90s became the forgotten recent past, while the Soviet period, the lost and rediscovered long-gone past. Russian society started to looking for the continuity with the Soviet past. The rupture with it was thus never accomplished. It was the search for this continuity that led Russian society towards the attempt to reconceptualize the memory of repressions. And this reconceptualization included three dimensions. First of all, discursive uh, rationalization of repressions. Secondly, intensified usage of the discourse of reconciliation. And uh, lastly, monopolization of the historical knowledge and elaboration of the one and only historic uh, narrative. And uh, this is what President Vladimir Putin said in 2003 
regarding uh, history textbooks that are to be used at schools uh, because uh, it was the textbooks, school textbooks, that were, became the most important issue in this uh, problem of uh, rationalization. When I say rationalization, what do I mean? I mean that repressions were interpreted as a necessary, if not inevitable, instrument of the intensified modernization. And uh, this strategy resulted in constructing a narrative of Stalin as an efficient manager. Stalin as efficient manager, this is a very important and widespread man uh, uh, today in Russia. Uh, in 2006, uh, the working group of historians was uh, constituted, established, and their task was to uh, write a new textbook of history of uh, Russia the 20th century. They succeeded in a way. Uh, repressions were interpreted in these textbooks as a necessary and efficient method of management, the method that complied with the epoch and uh, uh, that was inevitable uh, during this epoch. Collectivization, for example, was interpreted as uh, an instrument of raising means needed for industrialization. The organized famine of the 30s has never existed. The big terror of 30s, as Stalin's reaction uh, to uh, resistance he faced when trying to modernize the country. The occupation of Poland in 1939 as the liberation campaign and the Katyn uh, massacre as the response to the deaths of thousands of Red Army prisoners of war in Poland in 19, uh, 1920. The uh, attempts to rationalize repressions were, however, pewned by some members of the Russian society, and the most important sign, sign of the failure, uh, so-called failure of these attempts, was the President Medvedev's address to the nation in uh, 2009, where he stated, and I quote, and there is no justification for repressions, and you can see the longer, uh, longer quote in the, on the screen. Uh, an important part in counteracting these attempts to rationalize and justify repressions was played by the Presidential Council for Civil Society in Human Rights. Since 2011, a standing committee for historical memory is working within this council. And uh, in 2011, they submitted the project of a program on perpetuating the memory of victims of the totalitarian regime and on national reconciliation. The acknowledgement of the fact that repressions actually took place, the remembrance of their victims, was represented in the project as a means to establishing national cohesion. Uh, what uh, one of the most important ways, the project says, uh, of overcoming mutual alienation of the people and the elite is the full recognition of the Russian catastrophe of the 20th century. And you can see here some of the aims that were mentioned in, in this program. According to the authors of the program, the emphasis is supposed to be put, and I quote, not on the accusation of those of our predecessors who committed the genocide, the destruction of the faith and morale, but on honoring and perpetuating the memory of the victims of the regime. Uh, as the result of the initiative of this committee, the concept of the state policy uh, to perpetuate the memory of uh, victims of political repressions was finally approved in 2015, so just a few months ago. What is supposed to be done according to uh, this concept? Facilitating access to archives, establishing uh, infrastructure, the so-called, which means museums, monuments, memorial plaques, and so on and so forth. Uh, elaborating and implementing educational programs, scientific research, identifying sites of mass graves and uh, uh, sites of uh, mass executions, databases, multimedia groups, and so on and so forth. What is not to be done, according to this pro program? Compensating harm and losses to the victims of political repressions, prosecuting in any way those responsible for the repressions, and what is the most interesting in my mind, political and or legal evaluating of repressions. This is what is absolutely excluded for, from this 
uh, the program. The, uh, oh, sorry. No, not sorry. <laughs> right. Uh, the attempts uh, to rationalize repression, as well as the failure of these attempts, were accompanied by the intensified usage of the discourse of reconciliation or national cohesion, promoting integrity of the nation and fostering this cohesion are now proclaimed more or less explicitly one of the main goals of the policy of memory. The nation is to be united in the present and united with its past. The unity is achieved through forgetting the tragedies and the remembering the victories of the past rather than vice versa. One of the first steps towards this unity was taken in the beginning of 2000s when the national flag, emblem, and anthem were established. The flag, uh, as you probably know, as well as the emblem, clearly belonged to Russia's imperial past, while the anthem, uh, of course, to, to the Soviet, is a part of the Soviet heritage, actually. Another important event was the introduction of the new national holiday, the Day of People's Unity. It is celebrated annually on November 4th, and commemorates the anniversary of the expulsion of the Polish troops from Moscow in 1612. Uh, the history of this uh, holiday is uh, rather specific, I would say, quite interesting. Uh, it was introduced as a substitution to the most important holiday of the Soviet epoch, November 7th, which was the anniversary of the Great Socialist Revolution. In 1996, November 7th was renamed, it was called the Day of Reconciliation and Cohesion, and finally in 2005 the, it became the Day of, people, of People's Unity. And interest, interest, interestingly enough, since 2005, November, November 4th became the day uh, when Russian marches take place in Moscow, St. Petersburg, and a lot of other big cities. Russian marches are demonstrations of uh, Russian uh, far-right nationalists. So this is the, the day of uh, people's unity, uh, more or less the way it looks like today. Um, the uh, monopolization of the historical knowledge and the elaboration of the one and only historic narrative became very important components of the policy of memory in Russia since the beginning of 2000s. Among the instruments used uh, for this monopolization were establishing of the institutions that are aimed at identification of the so-called historical truth and promotion of this historical truth uh, on the national as well as on the international market and also reinforcing control over the, over the content of the textbook of history. And this is, again, Vladimir Putin, who in 2002 said, we shall defend the truth about the great patriotic war uh, and fight against any attempt to distort the truth and insult the memory of those who fell. Of course, the, the great patriotic war is the most important issue within this, uh, this policy. In 2009, the Presidential Commission of Russian Federation to counter attempts to falsify history to the detriment of Russia's interest was established. Out of 28 members of the commission, five were professional historians. Other 23 were anything but professional historians. And the commission, or the chief of this com uh, commission, uh, was the, the chief of the presidential administration, Sergei Narishkin, who is not a professional historian also. Uh, the commission uh, ceased to exist in 2012, but the other two commissions were established. First, the Russian Historical Society, again uh, headed by Sergei Narishkin, uh, and the so-called Russian Military Historical Society, headed by a, a notorious Minister of Culture of Russian Federation, Vladimir Medinsky. Uh, in 2010, uh, the discussion concerning textbooks on history began again, and uh, finally, a few months ago, a new textbooks on history were published, uh, the textbooks that are supposed to be used in all the schools uh, in, in Russian Federation, with no exception. Uh, within these textbooks, uh, repressions are mentioned. Uh, the authors dedicated a page to the repressions. Uh, 
uh, while uh, the number of uh, their victims was not discussed in, in any way. Inasmuch as the state efforts uh, are aimed at suppressing the memory of repressions, the civil society takes the responsibility for preserving this memory, while the state politics concerning the history of repression is in fact the politics of oblivion, their remembrance is related to cultural practices initiated by the society, which is discovering the sites of mass murders and mass graves, memorials and monuments, establishment, uh, libraries, archives, supporting scientific research, instituting museums, and so on and so forth. We have uh, two prominent NGOs that work in the field. One is the memorial. It was established in 1989, and now it, it unites dozens of branches all over Russia and abroad. And the other one is the center of Andrei Sakharov, who was a pro prominent Soviet physicist and dissident, and this center works in Moscow, also dedicates uh, a, a greater part of its work to uh, commemorating victims of repressions. Quite numerous are websites and web platforms that are dedicated to remembering repressions and honoring their victims. Usually they contain documents, books, texts on history of repressions, video and audio records of testimonials of those who survived, databases of sites of mass murders and mass graves, databases of monuments and uh, memorials. Uh, museums uh, that are dedicated to political repressions are not great in number, but however they do exist. The most famous one is of course Prem 36. It is the only museum in Russia that was founded on the site of the camp where political prisoners uh, were incarcerated. And the other important one is the State Museum of Gulag, which is situated in Moscow. It's the state museum, the only state museum in the country, uh, dedicated to their repressions. And uh, just uh, a few months ago, it uh, received a new building in the city center of Moscow, which is sort of good news, I suppose. Uh, as for the memorial sites, the most famous and prominent one is uh, Butovo. It's uh, not far from Moscow. The Butovo was a firing ground, uh, and it was uh, the site of mass executions between 1937 and 1938. Over uh, 20,000 people were shot and buried in uh, mass graves in Butovo. Another memorial is Komunarka, also not far away from Moscow. You can see it on the page, uh, on the screen here. And uh, I suppose this one would be interesting, is the Mednaya Memorial Complex, where over 6,000 Polish uh, citizens shot in 1940 are buried, and over 5,000 Soviet citizens that fell victims to their repressions. In Russia, there are over 700 memorials, mem uh, monuments of all sorts dedicated to victims of political repressions. And what is interesting is that the public, with no or little participation of the state, financed the establishment of the majority of them. So these are all public's initiatives. The most important of these monuments are two Sovki stones, one in Moscow, the one on the left is from Moscow and the one on the right is in St. Petersburg. The, the, the stones were delivered from Solovki Island, the, uh, the place where the famous Gulag, that actually, uh, Gulag camp that actually started the whole system of Gulag was situated. Uh, this is one from monument from St. Petersburg, it's called the Sphinxes. Uh, and the design belongs to Mikhail Shemakin. It is, uh, is established right across the river uh, of the Riva, across uh, from the prison Pristine, famous and uh, the sinister prison in, in St. Petersburg. Uh, this wonderful thing is called the Mask of Grief. The design belongs to Ernst Nies Vesny and it's established in Magadan, the, the so called capital of the uh, uh, Gulag system. And uh, another sort of good news, uh, in September 2015, President Putin took the decision to establish a monument to victims of political repressions in Moscow. The monument is to be called the Wall of Grief, and we have the project, but not, not, not yet the, the monument. It would, however, be a mistake to, to say that civil society is united in the desire to remember repressions, 
while the uh, official uh, discourse is aimed at oblivion these repressions. For example, in 2015, two monuments dedicated to Stalin were established in Russia, and both of them, the establishment of both of them was financed by the public, not, not, not by the government. So the situation is very complex. Uh, summing up, uh, since the beginning of 90s, uh, Russia has been drifting from remembering repressions towards the attempts more or less uh, successful to, to forget them. And the path we, we passed during this time was the path from memory to oblivion. It is uh, worth specifying, how, however, that the oblivion, the concept, uh, is multidimensioned. And applying the terminology of Polka, we may say that the memory of repressions in modern Russia is at the same time superficially ritualized and expelled from uh, public discourse. The oblivion uh, Russian society faces is not a repressive erasure, but a prescriptive <coughs> forgetting. It is a publicly approved forgetting and forgiving in the name of political reconciliation and uh, uh, national cohesion. The Today Russia Memory Project is aimed at constructing a grand narrative, narrative of building a great nation and a great state. This narrative belongs to the era of modernity and is essentially modernist. Uh, it disregards small story of a common person and also extracts Russia from the wider historical context, emphasizing its specific past. Um, the collective trauma of repressions is overshadowed by the traumas considered to be more important, which are the Great Patriotic War and the collapse of the Soviet Union. And, uh, uh, Russian society, we may say, did not decide for the rupture with the Soviet past. It, on the contrary, is searching for some sort of continuity with it. And uh, it is this Soviet past that Russia is trying to find its roots within. And uh, the memory of this past or the oblivion of this past becomes basis for the present identity of the Russian nation. Would it be possible to constitute such an identity and build a nation itself grounded in remembering that rather than uh, forgetting? This is the question Russian society will have to find the answer to one day. Thank you very much for your attention.